I'm Mike Ward. I want to talk to you about the equity risk premium. Sometimes we uh, call that the market risk premium, and uh, but what it really stands for, otherwise known as the extra return equity investors or shareholders should get for taking on risk. And when we measure risk, we have a base in terms of you could put your money into shares, which is risky, or you could put your money into government bonds, long-term government bonds. So we're looking for how much extra, on average, should shareholders get. Now, you will be familiar, I hope, with the capital asset pricing model. Uh, if not, you might want to watch some other video links which talk more about that. But the the, the capital asset pricing model, which was formulated in the 60s by people like Markowitz and others, essentially says in a very simple form, we can estimate the expected return on a share, in this case, share I, by looking at the risk-free return, what you would get from bonds, plus the market risk premium, that's what the constant we're looking for in this little video, times the shares beta. This is a measure of the riskiness of the share. Now, it's a very simple model, and it simply says, take the risk-free return, the long-term bond rate, expected returns at any rate, times uh, plus the beta of the share times the market risk premium. So I'm just writing it out for you in some detail over here. If we were to take an example of, say, Tesla, and we made some assumptions here that the risk-free rate is which is the 10-year T-bond rate, happened to be about 6.5%. And we might even want to take an average of some years, not just a spot rate for that. We might also just assume that Tesla's beta is, say, 1.2, and that the market risk premium, that's the thing we're trying to, to look at in this particular video, is, let's say, 4.5%. We would plug that into the CAPM, and then the expected equity return for Tesla, any shareholders investing in Tesla, would be, say, 6.5%, what they could earn from bonds, plus 1.2 times 4.5%, which gives us an expected return for Tesla of about 12%. So that's how this is being used. Now, where do we get this equity risk premium from? Well, one place to look is what did the participants of the third equity risk premium forum in 2021 actually think themselves. And so, uh, in fact, we're going to look at uh, the 2001 S equity risk premium conference. What, what did those participants think? And you can see that um, they, they, they picked a market risk premium anywhere between 0% and maybe 7%. The mode, most common, was 4%. So most of the participants said, well, it's somewhere here, but most likely 4%. 20 years later, in 2021, uh, the conference ran again, and you can see a slightly better distribution over here, uh, but still, we're coming down with a mode of about 4%, but some participants said one, and some said more than six. So we're not sure. Now, another way to look at this is, just to, is to have a look at asset yields, um, various classes of assets, bonds and equities and so on over a period of time. And you can see here we've got a time series of these and the one we're interested in here is the equity risk premium. The first thing to note is that it's extremely volatile. It changes quite a bit depending on what's happened to, in the market uh, at any particular time. It can also be at times negative as a spot rate and uh, and it can it can go from minus 2% almost, up to about 8% at different times. So we, since we are using the market risk premium for uh, a long-term estimate, we don't want to use a particular spot rate at any particular time. So what we could do uh, would be to take a long-term average, so we're looking at about 40 years here, and uh, you can see that works out at about 3.5%. But bear in mind, this data is for US markets. Maybe it's different for other markets. So, but it's a good starting point. Three and a half percent, something like that for the market equity risk premium. Another place to look is to go and have a look at the, uh, the 
fairly famous data set that Dimson, Marsh, and Staunton put together, looking at all the stock markets in the world, actually, that, it, that have existed, where we've got data at any rate, from the year 1900. And uh, what they've done here, and you can see some of the markets that are listed up down at the bottom here, is they've calculated the equ equity risk premium relative to bills, that's short-term uh, bonds, government bonds, if you like, and bonds, long-term government instruments. Now, we're more interested in bonds because they're less risky, don't move as much as bills, and that's uh, we're looking for really a long-term estimate for this, so it's probably more appropriate to use bonds. And uh, unfortunately, though, these bars, which tend to draw your attention here, are all related to bills. Uh, if you have a look at this, first thing you observe, though, is it's very different for different parts of the world. This is Belgium, Norway, Spain, Denmark, and so on. And over here, you've got Japan, South Africa, and Germany. And they, these are almost twice as high. And this is measuring data over 116 years here. So uh, maybe we, we've got to be a bit more uh, careful about it. The world, which is the weighted average of all the markets over this 100 years, 116 years, uh, came out at 4.3%, but that's against bills. Against bonds, we're looking more like 3.5%, somewhere down here, or 3.2%, actually. So one thing that's clear, though, is that really we should not expect to get the same market premium for different countries. And uh, you can see down here, uh, and this, of course, th this data, of course, includes two world wars, which, which were largely fought in Europe. And so you, you're seeing some, some pretty terrible market risk premiums down here in Belgium and Norway and Spain and Denmark and so on. And pretty good returns over here for Japan, South Africa, Germany, Austria, Austria, not maybe, yeah, it's there. So we, we need to maybe look at particular currencies or maybe different markets. Uh, it's going to be different. So here I'm focusing on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, and I'm using more recent data. I'm going back to 1960, uh, where we've got pretty good data, and that's for 60 years. And what the red line is showing you, if you had invested one rand in the Johannesburg All Share Index, the total return, including dividends and all other corporate actions and so on, would have given you a return over 60 years of about 16.1%. That's in rands. Now, if you had put your money into the all bond index, now that's mostly long-term bonds, but not totally. And again, we're, we're looking at total return indices here, all the movements of those bonds that affected the, the pricing. You can see your uh, one rand would have been worth, would have been generated a return of about 7.8%. Now, what we're interested in here is the, is the gap. The premium, what extra did shareholders earn over bonds? To do that, we take uh, one plus this number divided by one plus the, the return on bonds, and minus one is going to give us a premium of 7.7% over the last 60 years for the Johannesburg stock market. Now, it's interesting as well. You can see I've plotted here a price relative, which is really just measuring the gap between the um, red line and the blue line. This is obviously a log uh, index over here, which is what we want. And uh, you can see what is interesting though, is that the, the green line is telling us that this premium was pretty steady over the time period that we're looking at here. It didn't uh, suddenly come up or come down. It's It pretty much sticks closely to this dotted line that I've uh, plotted on top here. So for the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, using this data, if you trust it, you might argue that the market risk premium is as high as 7.7% in rands. Now, summing up then, what does this tell us? When we're trying to estimate the equity risk premium, we're looking for a long-term standard constant here, which is going to give us the kind of return shareholders are going to get over the next, who knows, 10, 20 years. So it's likely to be different for different markets and different currencies. We can see that from the data. 
Uh, we need to use several years of historical data to get a feel for this because we don't want a spot rate. And uh, we're, we're going to use this to estimate the terminal growth rate uh, in our um, <clears throat> valuation model, most likely. And so we should use total equity returns, including dividends, after corporate actions, all of those kind of things, and the same with long-term bond rather than bills. I hope that you found that helpful and interesting. Thank you.